Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Queenie from the Environment Bureau, and I'm very happy today to have Green Council um, invite me to share with you all about uh, what we is doing um, to reduce our carbon emissions, mainly from the perspective of revamping our fuel mix. Electricity generation accounts for around two-thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions in Hong Kong, followed by transport, 18%, and then waste and others. So changing our fuel mix plays a key role in our decarbonization strategy. Uh, for every society in planning the fuel mix, it is important to bear in mind a few uh, important uh, policy objectives. So first, we have to ensure that our electricity demand is to be met safely, reliability at a reasonable cost, as well as to minimize the environmental impact of electricity generation. And these policy objectives are in fact competing with one another. In the sense that, for instance, if we want to maintain our high reliability in our supply, we need to invest in our infrastructure, and this will mean there will be pressure on tariffs. So this is quite an art in arriving at an optimal fuel mix, and this is what every society is facing. We have different fuels to choose from, and they have different performance in the carbon emissions. So of course, the dirtiest is coal, and we are now trying to use more natural gas. And natural gas um, emits about half of the amount of carbon than coal. So its performance is better than coal. And of course, we have some more uh, other cleaner energy, like uh, renewable energy, nuclear, as well as power input. And they're all zero carbon. Uh, we do not start our decarbonization today. We have started our uh, strategy uh, many, many years ago. Starting from 1994, we began to import nuclear power from the mainland. And our contract um, with the Daibei nuclear power station runs till 2034. So from now till 2034, we have around at least one-fourth uh, one of our electricity demand can be met by this uh, zero carbon nuclear power. And in 1996, um, our two uh, we have the, uh, the first gas fired electricity plants. And then since 1997, we do not allow the two power companies to build any more new coal plants in Hong Kong. Then it comes to 2014. In 2014, we conducted uh, an important public consultation on our 2020 fuel mix for electricity generation. At that time, we basically put up two options for the public to choose. One is to import more power from the mainland through grid purchase. Another one is to increase our local gas generation. Both aim at improving the environment, environmental performance of our electricity generation. At that time, most of the views received supported more local electrical gas generation and expressed reservation about importing more electricity from the mainland, uh, main, mostly mainly on the ground of uh, fears about uh, how we can maintain supply reliability if we are to import more power from the mainland. And having considered such views, we announced in the next year, 2015, about our 2020 Fumix plan. Uh, we announced that by 2020, we will increase our local gas power generation from the current around 25% uh, to 50. And at the same time, we'll reduce our coal generation from around half at present to one fourth by 2020. And we will maintain um, around one fourth of our electricity demand from nuclear power import. And then in 2017, the government published the Climate Action Plan 2030+. Plus. In that Climate Action Plan, we announced our 2030 carbon reduction target of 65 to 70% by 2030, using 2005 as the base. In term, and we also announced a, a number of measures how we are going to achieve this 2030 target. In terms of fuel mix, we have announced that uh, we'll phase down coal-fired generation as the coal plants retire in the coming decade or so with net and replace them with natural gas and other cleaner energy. 
And in recent years, the government has put in quite a number of efforts to, uh, to develop renewable energy locally. We have launched a number of uh, facilitation measures and with the government taking the lead. Uh, for example, uh, the government has uh, built the largest solar farm in Hong Kong in our Siu Ho Wan sewage treatment plants. And we are also exploring um, floating, developing floating PV panels on our reservoirs. And if they are successful, and so far they are uh, proved to be quite successful, if we are going to implement it in a larger scale, it gives us quite a number of potential because um, our reservoir has a lot of surface area. And apart from these large scale projects, we also uh, earmarked a total of $2 billion for different government departments to install RE facilities at the venues, like on police stations, in markets, at parks, etc. And for the private sector, we have been uh, trying to create conditions to facilitate the development of RE by the private sector. So one key measure is the fit and tariff scheme introduced by the government and the two power companies since October last year. Under the scheme, one can sell the renewable energy they generate to the power companies at a rate much higher than the prevailing tariff rate from three to five Hong Kong dollars present. So um, this can help uh, re drastically reduce the payback period of the investment in the RE system. And this is a very, uh, quite successful scheme I can say because um, since the launch of the scheme um, October last year, in a few months time, um, we have received um, a total of more than 2,000 applications. And when, when compared to before we have the fit in tariff scheme, over so many years, there are, there are less than 100 of um, RE systems installed by the private sector. And apart from the fit and tariff scheme, which provides financial incentives to the private sector to develop renewable energy, we have also relaxed the buildings related to requirements, especially for our village houses in the new territories. And before we relax the requirements. They can install PV panels on the roof with supporting structures, but up to 1.5 meters height. And this um, gives quite um, some deterrence to uh, the village owners to install PV panels and the rooftop because they cannot enjoy the roof. So we announced in the policy address last year and have already implemented this, is that we relaxed the the height restriction of the supporting structure for PV panels to 2.5 meters, so that um, the village house owners, they can install the panels, at the same time they can enjoy the roof. And after uh, we have relaxed the buildings related requirements for village houses, um, we can see their jump in the application for a uh, foot and tariff scheme. Um, from the village houses, and we, ha we have received complaints from our partner, <laughs> CLP, <laughs> about the increased <laughs> workload <laughs> from <laughs> the application of village, ho uh, village house owners after we have announced the realization. And we have also announced another scheme uh, in the policy address last year, is that uh, it's called Solar Harvest, uh, which under which the government provides a one-stop service to actually install PV panels for schools and welfare NGOs. So this is a pretty hazel-free uh, program. The schools and the welfare NGOs, they simply have to uh, submit an application form to the government. And the government will conduct a site visit, do the technical feasibility, design the system, procure the system and actually install the system for the schools and NGOs. This can save much of um, the efforts because we know that teachers and social workers, they're not expertise in RE installation. So we hope we can provide this one-stop service to them so that this no not only can help increase our renewable energy proportion, but they, this can also serve as an educational tool, especially for schools. And Last year, we have approved the development plans of the power companies, and on the development plan, um, one of the items is that we approved CLP's proposal to enhance the existing clean energy transmission system. So with um, the enhancement of the clean energy transmission system, it gives us the capability and flexibility to use more zero carbon energy from the mainland. And if this system is put 
to maximum use because this can allow us to advance our achievement of our 2030 carbon intensity reduction target. So from now until 2030, we mainly decarbonize our fuel mix by using more natural gas. But using more natural gas still incurs carbon emissions. So this is not our ultimate goal. But how we are we going to achieve um, a more aggressive carbon reduction target? Um, we have to use more zero carbon energy. And we have to, in fact, we need to substantially increase the proportion of zero carbon energy in our fuel mix. We have made a preliminary assessment that if we are to achieve the Paris Agreement two degrees Celsius target, then in fact majority of our fuel mix has to come from zero carbon energy. At present, um, we have around one fourth of our fuel mix coming from zero carbon energy. Mainly is from the nuclear power import and a little bit of our local renewable energy. So we need to have a drastic change in our fuel mix if we are to achieve the Paris Agreement's two degrees Celsius target. And it's now the right time to review our long-term fuel mix plan. Why? Because timely decision is very important. Um, many of the two power companies' coal plants will reach the end of the usable life in the next decade or so. We need to decide what fuel and what uh, plants we are going to use to replace these retiring coal plants. If we have no, we cannot reach a consensus on what new energy we are going to use and rely on the existing practice of replacing them with natural gas, then we have to know that a gas unit, once in place, will normally operate for 30 years or so. So once we replace a retiring coal plant with a gas unit, and gas, using gas, as I said, it still incurs uh, carbon emissions. There will be little way to drastically reduce our carbon emissions in the next 20 to 30 years. So when everyone in the world is talking about looking forward to the decarbonization towards 2050, it seems to be a long way to go, but in fact, we need to make a decision now on how we're going to do it. So how can we do it? So um, zero carbon energy, as I said, renewable energy, nuclear power import. So um, can we develop more renewable energy locally? Yes, we can, and we are actually doing it. But we need to admit that um, we are facing a lot of physical constraints in Hong Kong, and we have limited potential. Um, according to our estimate, Hong Kong only has 3 to 4% local renewable energy potential from our solar, wind, and waste to energy projects. Um, we are reviewing this figure, three to four percent, um, but we do not expect a drastic increase in the potential estimate under or with the current technology. Um, as you can see some illustration here, we have made an estimation. If we have to meet 10% of our electricity demand from solar, approximately, based on the technology and efficiency of the PV panels nowadays, we need the size of about one Chai plus central and western district all installed with PV panels to meet this 10% electricity consumption. So, um, given that Hong Kong land is very <coughs> valuable <laughs> and is the public ready to us in ready to invest to make such heavy investment in this local RE, both in terms of money and in terms of land? And we have also looked into some overseas countries um, which may have used a large amount of renewable energy. And they have something which we currently do have do not have. Like they usually have abundant renewable energy resources like hydro and wind or even geothermal, which is more stable. And they also depend a lot on regional cooperation. Like in Europe, they have a very strong interconnected power grid because renewable energy, one of the important characteristics is that it is intermittent in nature. So they need stable uh, fuel sources to supplement the use of renewable energy to maintain the reliability. Uh, when the sun is not shining, when the wind is not blowing, for example, at night, we cannot use 
renewable energy, much or most of the renewable energy, and we need other um, supply to maintain the, the reliability. But in Hong Kong, we now we have connected to the Daibei nuclear power station, and we are going to enhance our existing clean energy transmission system, but it is quite limited. So if we are going to use a lot of or increase our use of local RE to a large extent, then we need to have a more strengthened regional cooperation network. So, as I said, even if we are going to strive our very best to develop our local RE, we have a very uh, limited potential, like single digit. So, um, like many cities in the world, um, we have to consider if we are going to use regional energy cooperation. Um, many cities in the world, given that cities by cities, they are usually having many constraints. They usually rely on suburban areas or other areas in the, in the bigger picture to help them to achieve carbon reduction. But is our public ready to accept importing more power from the mainland, which they have expressed reservation in 2014? And even if it is so, it is, uh, we need to decide very soon because building a cross-boundary power transmission infrastructure, infrastructure takes time, perhaps more than 10 years in planning and actual construction. So on all these questions, the government has invited the Council for Sustainable Development to conduct a public engagement exercise in the coming few months um, on the long-term decarbonisation strategy in Hong Kong. So we hope that um, the Council can, through this document, can explain what is carbon emissions, what are the ways to reduce carbon emissions, and what are the public views on whether and how we can achieve our long-term decarbonisation. And the council, after receiving the public views, they will prepare a report for the government <coughs> to consider. So <coughs> I would strongly encourage you to express your views to the council when the public engagement exercise is launched, so that we can know um, what our public wants in decarbonizing our Hong Kong. And of course, today, um, due to time, so I have focused on revamping our fuel mix. Of course, there are other ways um, to help uh, mitigate and reduce our carbon emissions, like practicing energy savings in buildings, and like greening our transportation by using rail as our backbone and control private car uh, growth, and doing pr um, raising public awareness on low carbon consumption, like making less overseas trips, uh, waste reduction, water conservation, etc. But um, this is, um, maybe you can know more about this when, we, when the Council for Sustainable Development launched its public engagement exercise. So this is the end of my sharing. So I'm happy to take a few questions before I leave. Thank you. Now conduct a Q&A session for Queenie. Are there any questions from the audience? Queenie, Felix from Queen Council. You have mentioned about um, LNG, natural gas. That means there will be a lot of LNG for Hong Kong in the coming uh, decade. And for transportation fuel, in fact, Hong Kong is still using um, Diesel, gasoline, they are also um, emit a lot of uh, CO2. Because of the availability of LNG will be in Hong Kong, would you consider to import, to consider LNG vehicle like LNG bus? Because electronic bus, electrical bus in Hong Kong is not viable. But LNG bus is very successful over the, over the world. Would you consider the natural gas vehicle? I'm afraid I cannot give you a very concrete answer because um, electric vehicles or energy LNG vehicles is under another team of the department, so I have no idea about the latest development. But I think they are open the mind. But in Hong Kong, I think they have to rely on um, the whether there are sufficient supply in Hong Kong because we have no our, no manufacturers in Hong Kong about these buses and they have to rely on import and I think they are looking for different kinds of supply of different kinds of energy buses to see whether they can be used in Hong Kong. 
Are there any further questions for Queenie? Thanks, Queenie, for the very interesting talk. Uh, under the Paris Agreement, does Hong Kong come under China in terms of the uh, reporting the future plans? Yes, Hong Kong, um, we come under China because China is the party who signed the Paris Agreement. And Hong Kong comes under, like Macau, we come under China in reporting our carbon emissions as well as to report our future plans. Hi. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation that you want to focus more on uh, cross-border uh, cooperation or regional cooperation uh, and that uh, that there will be uh, uh, that the pu you will ask the public on their opinion can you maybe make that a bit more concrete what what the public will be able to 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 give an answer to because it's it, it sounds very high level in terms of designing the exact fuel mix, uh, we do not expect the public will have the adequate knowledge to make this technical decision. But we would like to uh, come clean and, and make a factual um, explanation that if we are to achieve the Paris Agreement 2 degrees Celsius uh, target, then we have to have majority of a fuel mix are from zero carbon energy. So they are limited. we have limited choice right now in Hong Kong. We can do a little bit of renewable energy, given our very limited potential. And then if we have to achieve that target based on the current technology, then we have to consider importing more power from the mainland. And on this, I think the Council for Susta Sustainable Development in its coming public engagement exercise will gauge the public view on as part of the long-term decarbonization plan whether Hong Kong is going to move to this direction in terms to decarbonize. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, zero carbon uh, electricity, which is, uh, uh, is, is do you mean uh, nuclear? or also importing, for example, renewable energy. Because uh, if you look at Hong Kong, I, I, I see the picture you show, and you show uh, how what it takes to, to, uh, to make sol solar panels in Hong, uh, Hong Kong. But we also don't have gas. We also have no coal. Uh, we have no nuclear. So actually, we're importing all our current uh, energy. So l also looking at importing renewable energy into Hong Kong. We do not have a fixed option or idea on this because we're talking about 2050 decarbonization in a very long term. And it, what fuel we are going to import depends on a number of factors in terms of like availability. And in terms of uh, counting carbon emissions, in fact, um, power import, even if you import coal-fired generation, generator power. For Hong Kong, it is counted as zero carbon. But is it what the community is going to accept? If is what our Hong Kong community expecting that we just say we're importing coal, then we claim that it is zero carbon. Is it what we're expecting? Then we have to, through this public engagement exercise, to see. So, of course, um, we want to import more renewable energy or as far as possible. But um, is it is it is that amount available in the mainland China when also other com cities are competing for renewable energy? And how we are going to import the renewable energy in the sense that we can, at the same time, maintain our reliability given the intermittent nature of renewable energy. All these, we have to sort this out. But uh, as a general concept, uh, we would like to gauge the public views on whether the regional energy cooperation concept is acceptable to the public if we are going to have a long, achieve a long-term decarbonization target. Thank you. Are there any more questions? All right. Thank you, Queenie.